Brad, welcome to Starkville. I think it's your first visit here, right? It, it is my first visit, and uh, it is definitely a pleasure to be on with you guys. And uh, uh, yeah, exciting times right now in Philly for sure. Yeah, and uh, just so people know, Brad is in Philadelphia as we record this. Um, and that brings up a, a kind of a fun topic. I heard one of your co-hosts on MLB Network Radio the other day kidding you that you were going to throw out the first pitch for both teams in this <laughs> World Series. Is there any chance that's actually going to happen, Brad? Um, there is very little to no chance that that is uh, going to happen, but uh, uh, there might, you know, there might be uh, some first pitch action happening at some point. I think it's, uh, we're still kind of uh, figuring that one out, but uh, really? if, if there's going to be a team I'm not doing it for, it will be uh, Houston. We'll just throw that out there. Um, <laughs> okay. So if, obviously the Astros don't have a good sense for the moment anymore. <laughs> what, it would have been great. You know, so what are your emotions watching these two teams play in a world series. Uh, I spent six years with the Astros who drafted you four seasons with the Phillies, where you threw the final pitch of the 2008 world series. Do do you feel more of a connection right now with one than the other? Um, So good question. And and I, yes, I I do. I I will first tell you that, uh, you know, I have a lot of close friends in in both spots, former teammates and, uh, you know, people you meet over the years, minor league teammates, everything else. Some of my closest friends still uh, with that Houston organization. And I obviously have a lot of great memories there and, uh, you know, got to play with some of the best veterans a a young player could ever possibly ask for example wise, role model wise, you know, Biggio, Bagwell, Osmus, uh, Billy Wagner, my mentor in that bullpen out there. So, um, you, know, you couldn't do a whole lot better than that. Obviously, Clemens and Pettit getting over there at some point, too. And, and so I feel super fortunate to have those memories, of those teammates. But uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, I feel a, a little more attached to the Phillies. And, uh, you know, it, it is obviously a point where or I should say this. It's, it's something where if you win a World Series with a city, uh, you know, I think for most players, that is that kind of becomes a spot that you want to just naturally go back to. But. The Phillies also, uh, you know, as soon as I retired, uh, they called me up and said, hey, listen, we want to retire you as a Philly. We want you to work with us a little bit. And uh, so, you know, we, they got me out there and uh, my, you know, they really pulled at the heartstrings. My kid, we, I got to throw a first pitch in one of the games and my, you know, they, they didn't tell me, but they had my kids at that time, uh, you know, seven and three years old, walk out the ball to me on the mound and stuff. So uh, they, they did their first class uh, organization. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little partial to the Phillies, but it is a weird uh, for sure, kind of an emotional <laughs> roller coaster watching these two teams. I'll tell you what, man, when when the bullpens come in, just because, you know, remembering pitching for the Astros and being in that ballpark and everything else. And then when the Phillies guys come in, uh, I got to have a beer just to be able to calm down and watch the game. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, emotions at, uh, at this point. Yeah. So, so Brad, I'm curious, uh, you know, I'm sure you've uh, had this question asked a few times, but if you compare the teams, right, you're looking at 2022 and you have you know it seems like a lot of people are saying this team's having a lot of fun you know they're just enjoying themselves uh you know what's your take of memories about the 08 team uh or, or that sort of that period versus now yeah well I think there are definitely some parallels and it's certainly uh you know for me one of the things that you have to do to get to this point is you kind of have to come together uh you know toward the end of the season and uh you know we had we weren't a perfect team in 08 but you know we were playing our best baseball uh, that last month of the season. And then obviously in the postseason, I remember we were having a ton of fun and like, you know, the regular season is such a grind and you've, you know, guys get injured and you're just trying to get through a lot of times. Um, we barely won the division uh, in, in 2008, but we were getting hotter and hotter as the season went on. I, I think, you know, for me, when the season stopped, it felt like we could have played another two months and, and, and done great because we had just, uh, coalesce so well at that time period and I think I see that also with the 2022 Phillies you know they didn't they didn't have the best regular season there definitely were some holes in the team uh, it wasn't the best defensive unit and you know they were trying to figure out their identity but all of a sudden you know fully healthy right now and you know tightening up everything including that defense the bullpen's been incredible um, obviously having Bryce back and healthy is a, is a huge deal for the offense but I just think we're seeing the team you know reaching its potential this October and uh, you know for me I, I think about the World Series in 2008 that I was with the Phillies uh, we go to Tampa we win game one lose game two and then come back to Philly and uh, you know that's kind of right where the Phillies are right now and 
you know, I, with all due respect to Houston, I, I would love to see the Phillies win this in, in five games here in Philadelphia. I think people, uh, obviously you guys know this, but you know, people forget that, that, uh, beating the Phillies in Philly this time of year is no easy task. There is <laughs> at home field advantage um, you know the Astros are, are an incredible team and they play really well but they have you know kind of ideal conditions every day when you're playing in that ballpark and all of a sudden you get outside it could be a little drizzle the weather could get a little colder and things kind of get neutralized a little bit and uh, you know the, then then uh, some real fun starts to happen you really got to <laughs> yeah you know that's the perfect segue for something I wanted to ask you about game three where which is where we are um, we're recording this Monday afternoon it's such a pivotal game, obviously, when the series is tied one to one. You had that exact scenario uh, in 2008, and um, that game got rain delayed for two hours <laughs> and didn't end till 1:47 a.m. We've got weather issues here now. Um, what do you remember about that day? knowing that rain was coming how much did you find yourself checking the weather forecast that whole day yeah unfortunately uh, quite a lot and you know it's it's one of those deals where it's like are we going to start on time are we going to be delayed are we just going to have the whole thing pushed to another day you know what's going to happen here um obviously world series games you got to get them in yeah you don't want to push too deep into uh, november well this year into november but it is it is frustrating as a player but at the same time you know you go through enough of these things during the regular season where you know how to stay loose you know you know what you need to do in the clubhouse the card games you need to play the food you need to eat whatever um and for me you know i always pitch obviously had pitched late in games and so you know whether the game started on time or not i definitely had a process but um you know i think for me i just once that game started, okay, now I can get into that process and uh, and get myself ready to pitch, you know, the ninth inning or whatever. Uh, but but it definitely, uh, you know, it's it's part of the the outdoor conditions of uh, you know city <laughs> in late October. I mean, this is what you're getting, and it's one of the reasons I think uh, you know a team like the Phillies uh, can can do so well. I mean, when you're used to playing outside all year in kind of adverse conditions, and uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you get all the fans because of fans aren't going to go anywhere like if this game is delayed or not it won't matter like everyone is going to be surrounding that stadium and it's going to be uh it's going to be pretty fun tonight halloween night you know everything else even if it's raining i have a feeling people will be very happy to stick around for an extra long time yeah i mean that game three and 08 uh carlos ruiz gets the the walk-off squibber at 1 47 a.m nobody went home (laughs) <laughs> of course not and then that wasn't even the big weather delay in that world series no. game five had a two-day intermission <laughs> right in the middle of it so your save of that final game was <sighs> so unique um i want to talk about it but first we have to hear the late great harry Callis call that final pitch fans on their feet rally towels are being waved Brad Lidge stretches. The 0-2 pitch, swing and a miss, struck him out. The <laughs> Philadelphia Phillies are 2008 World Champions of Baseball. Brad Lidge does it again and stays perfect for the 2008 season. <laughs> Amazing. We, we, we love these goosebump moments. <laughs> uh, hey, how much do you still think about that moment, that strikeout of Eric Hinsky? And and when you think about it, do you actually hear Harry Callis's <laughs> epic call in your head? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I, I just feel so fortunate that, uh, you know, I was in Philly when I was and that the, the great Harry Callis, you know, made that call because when I hear that and, uh, you know, obviously I've heard it a lot at this point, but every time that's <laughs> biggest pieces for me is that Harry Callis is doing it and uh just so much respect for him and and, and what he did in his life as a um you know covering so many things but really just somebody that you know we were, I was actually telling some of my friends this the other day there's not a whole lot of guys that work with the media that can make their way to the back of the airplane and just <laughs> kind of walk off a row of seats and you know have drinks with the team and and like no one ever thinks twice about it but he was that respected uh and so for me it made that moment so much better uh, that he was that he was on that call, but it uh, it still gives me goosebumps. First of all, I definitely felt that ju- uh, just now, and uh, you know I think I 
it's funny because I've seen the replay enough times where, you know, I have to try and remember, you know, being in that moment and <laughs> not looking at myself in that moment uh, from the camera, but actually being in that moment and, uh, you know, feeling <laughs> on the pitch and, you know, knowing I was going to throw a slider. So Chooch came out, I think, uh, you know, right before Hensky came out there and, uh, you know, we, we had a little meeting on the mound and uh, he's, he said, uh, you know, Rich Doobie, our pitching coach came out too. And he's like, Hey, uh, you faced him one time. You remember what happened? I said, yeah, I threw him a, a fastball and he waffled it off the wall. In the right. <laughs> and uh, Ryan Howard started laughing because he didn't, <laughs> he was like not expecting, you know, me, me to say that. But so then uh, I Chooch looked at me and he said, Hey, let's just throw as many sliders as it takes them. I said, all right, let's do it. <laughs> He never put down any signs that entire bat. We were just doing slider, 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 slider. <laughs> uh, eventually, eventually got a good one and, uh, and got him out. Yeah, well, that would be easy on pitch comm today, right? Just hit, hit, hit the same button over and over. <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious to get your take on, you know, sort of relieve, you know, how relievers have been used this postseason. Um, you know, just imagine a scenario where, they would have said, okay, Brad Lidge, we're going to have you set up for the seventh inning because that's the high leverage inning because you're about to face, you know, Harper Schwarber and Rail Muto or something. So uh, what have, you know, what's been your feeling about how bullpens have been used, the Dodgers, the Yankees, and how leverage has shifted? Because your role would have been different or at least how they would have used you would have been different. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, well, first of all, I would have had to do uh, <laughs> my stretching a little bit earlier, uh, get myself mentally ready. Um, and you know, it is, it's, it's interesting to me because there has been a transition and maybe Andrew Miller was one of the first guys to kind of do, uh, this so well and so agreeably, uh, you know, to throw in those high leverage innings. And, um, uh, I think there's been overall over the last like five, six years is kind of general buy-in, uh, from relievers that, that understand like, listen, I might be the closer most nights, but in certain games and certain high leverage situations, to your point, uh, I need to get ready to come in earlier. And I think. Um, there used to be something to that where, where a lot of closers probably wouldn't have wanted to do that. They probably wouldn't have had that buy-in. Um, but I think that, you know, statistically, analytically, I think a lot of guys understand now they're going to put me in the position where I'm going to have the most success. And so I, I should be okay doing this. And then, you know, the, the ego aside, guys are willing to pitch kind of in whatever ends and even established closers. Like it's, it, it kind of surprises me a little bit. The guys that are, you know, established during the ninth inning and they have their routine, even those guys, you know, in the, we see this year, but in the last couple of years, they're ready to get out there whenever there might be a handful of guys still like Kenley Jansen, probably not going to be thrown in that sixth, seventh inning. You know, I just, I don't know if he'll, he's, he's already done so much in the ninth inning. It'd be tough to teach an old dog new tricks right there, but um, pretty much everyone else gets to the major leagues and understands that that's going to be the case at some point uh, now. So, um, I like it. I think it makes a ton of sense. And uh, I think, you know, for a team like the Phillies right now, there's basically four guys that can close out a game, five guys that can close out a game. And, uh, you know, depending on if Ranger Suarez is out there or not. So for me, I think they all understand it. They've fully bought in. And uh, I think that allows for a lot more freedom for a manager, to be totally honest. Like Rob Thompson has, you know, whatever matchups he wants, he can put the guys in there at that time. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, for a manager, I think it, it, honestly, it makes more sense. I, I like to see the closer used tradition in the traditional ways. Having an established closer obviously is great for a manager too, but being able to maneuver guys uh, strategically, I think is a big advantage. You know, when you talked about changing routine, I almost forgot to circle back to that thing I wanted to ask you about. You know, other pitchers have obviously thrown the final pitch of a World Series. You're not the only one, but only you had to do it after what was basically a three inning game because you had the two day rain delay and you started that day in the bottom of the sixth inning Philly score immediately. What do you remember about how fast it seemed like you had to get ready for that save? It was crazy. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, the, you know, when you're at that point in the world series where you're, you know, one win away from winning the whole thing, it is so hard a to sleep because there's so much adrenaline just coursing through you and you just want to get the game started, but of course it gets delayed and then delayed again. Another, <laughs> I was really tired. I remember, but, but I also, you know, remember, yeah, I had to totally maneuver my, my warm up routine, everything else. I just, you know, my mind, I remember doing the, uh, you know, the minutes and the hours and trying to figure out, okay, if we start in the sixth inning, where am I normally at kind of back that up and, you know, into, into my routine. And, and so um, we were definitely on edge wanting to get that game 
started, like no question about it. And, and it's also really hard. Like for me, one of the big things I was able to do successfully that year, I believe is that I really stayed in the moment every single game. Like I never got ahead of myself. I always thinking about the hitters I was going to face and the pitches I was going to throw. But when you're one went away from winning a world series, your mind wants to go to that. And so I had to force myself to uh, just stay in the moment, stay in the moment, Think about the guys you're going to face. And then, of course, you know, the, it gets pushed back a day and then another day and everything else. So it was just it was difficult is uh, is the point there. And uh, I hope I hope that, uh, you know, other teams and other relievers don't have to go through that. But it was a, it was a crazy shotgun start right away. Um, you know, runs were scored. Action was happening. And it was uh, I had a really good feeling that I was going to get in there and it was going to be a one run lead. Yeah, that, that was such a crazy night. <laughs> Total pregame routine. Both teams take batting practice. And it was like a normal day, except the game starts in the sixth <laughs> inning. So, so nuts. Is there some story that's never been told about that save or that final pitch? Even if it's the thing about Ryan Howard wrecking your knee in the dog pile? <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a necessarily a story about it. I, I would I would just say that uh um, I remember being on the bottom of that pile and, uh, you know, screaming for joy with, you know, 20, 20 dudes, you know, 200, <laughs> 250 pounds. Vic Torino kept jumping off the pile. If you watch the replay, he would jump on top and then he'd go back, take 10 steps and then he'd do it again. again. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, at some point I was like, get off. But I mean, yeah, at some point my foot was up by my face and I was still screaming for joy. So it was just one of those moments of total elation where, uh, you know, even though you can't breathe and even though you're, you're kind of mangled on the bottom of the pile <laughs> you're screaming for sure. So, so do you have mugs and paintings and uh, t-shirts of that pitch or the dog pile all over your house? Uh, you, you can admit it if you do. Uh, uh, no mugs. Uh, you know, definitely there's, there's a painting too that, uh, that uh, I think my wife commissioned one uh, um, from uh, I think is uh, well, it's Opie ironically enough in Houston, he does, uh, his name's Opie does great uh, portraits of the Astros and the team, but she commissioned him to do one of the Phillies as well. And uh, had some other uh, artists that wanted to do something like that back in uh, Colorado as well, where I'm, where I'm from. And so, yeah, we do have some things up here and there, uh, but you know, we try not to uh, make it the, the centerpiece of it. I mean, you're, you'd be sort of, mistaken if you think my my wife would allow any pictures of me uh in our house they're they're all in the man cave <laughs> basement so um but yeah there, there's a few cool things uh certainly with the last pitch and certainly from that season that uh are uh, are in my my man cave office downstairs yeah so brad i'm i'm curious about um you know looking ahead okay after you win the world series in 08 it's sort of life after that, just the general. And I'm wondering about the the celebration and the beauty of it, right? Being known in Philadelphia and bringing that championship after 28 years, uh, but also the challenges. You know, you've definitely heard stories about some of the challenges of just adjusting to life and whether it's privacy or just like nothing ever measuring up to that. So, you know, what, I guess, tale do you have about life after that in the transition? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would just say this, I mean, that year, obviously changed uh, a lot of things for me, you know, had uh, a good start of my career, you know, however many years in Houston. Then, then, you know, after the big home run, it was kind of some down times there a little bit in 06 and 07, which led me to be traded. So I always, you know, look at back at that moment now fondly, uh, maybe not in 06 and 07, but uh, now I can do that with a little better perspective. And I think for me, it changed, you know, my, my life quite a lot, but also, yeah, like the day-to-dayness of it and, you know, in Philly and the Northeast, like all of a sudden, you know, at grocery stores, even, you know, you're, you're maybe just with your kids and whatever else, but there's a line of people, you know, after you get your groceries outside, uh, you know, it's, it's Philly, it's, uh, you know, South Jersey. So that people know where you shop and uh, <laughs> kind of autographs at all kinds of crazy places. But, um, you know, I never minded that aspect, honestly, of, of being a professional athlete. I always thought it was, uh, you know, I always got a kick out of it. And I think my kids did too. So um, it, it definitely changed life for us. And, uh, but in, in only great ways. I mean, I really have nothing negative to say to it. Yeah, there are some, some challenges, I guess, so to speak, but uh, only because, uh, you know, something very, something great happened. So I, I can't ever, uh, you know, think that those are, are negative things. And, uh, you know, the city of Philadelphia, I've been super fortunate, you know, that happened my first year here and they've, uh, they've been amazing, the fans here, and uh, they've kind of embraced uh, things ever since. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, in my heartstrings, I'm cheering for the Phillies. <laughs> you know, I remember that next spring training, uh, 
I, I showed you the pocket schedule for the 2009 season and your last pitch was a photo of it was on the cover of that. <laughs> and, and I remember I was talking about how that moment, when you have that moment, you see it everywhere. It never goes away. I, I'm curious, what, what's the strangest, craziest, most unexpected place you ever saw that photo? Uh, well, you know what? Um, that photo has, a, uh, I think a couple of years ago, I was at a, uh, a bar kind of on the outskirts of, uh, of Philly uh, with, uh, with some friends. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was all, it was on all the coasters in there. They were, they were doing some kind of, <laughs> But it was, it was 2018, it was the anniversary. So uh, it, it appears on, uh, you know, it does appear on a lot of odd things here and there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a beer coaster, maybe it's, you know, something else. But I, I have seen it, um, you know, I just, true story, last night we were uh, walking around Philly getting some dinner and uh, we we went around the corner and uh, next to a restaurant, Elvez, and a uh, oh, yeah. uh, little, right. there's a little picture on the wall. It's, uh, I, I, I took a picture, it kind of, got tickled a little bit it had a picture of me in that pose jason and uh, it's oh uh, you know one two three and then there was like an advertisement for for something else i don't even know what it was all <laughs> uh you know my my buddies were like oh you took us this way on purpose you just wanted to show us the <laughs> i didn't know this was here um so it does keep popping up and uh you know like i said i mean how could you ever uh, not be grateful to see something like that so uh um it it, it does appear in some uh, crazy places from time to time um, you know, another thing, Brad, you had great postseason moments with both teams. You also had painful moments with both teams. And I, I've, I've covered a lot of postseason baseball, been at a lot of postseason baseball games, been around a lot of players dealing with difficult moments. Um, nobody in all that time handled the tough moments with more professionalism uh, and accountability than you did. How hard was it to stand there? And answer questions after some World Series game, some postseason game that that gets away when you're on the mound. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I I, I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, you know, I think uh, again, coming up in Houston with some incredible role models uh, uh, that really you know kind of set you straight in terms of how you needed to be accountable for you know for everything. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, there were definitely really hard moments. I mean, there's no question about it. You know, it, it, 2005 obviously jumps off the page on that. Um, but there were times where I, you know, I would get frustrated because you get asked the same question a lot. And, uh, and then, you know, maybe a wave of, uh, of, of media kind of comes and goes. And then all of a sudden, you know, 15 minutes later, you're like, all right, now I need to clear my head space and get ready to, to pitch. And, uh, and then the next wave would come in and ask the same question. So, um, you know, I think uh, there was times for me where I had to be careful. Like I wanted to be accountable uh, for sure. And, 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 you know, if people had questions, fine, let's do it. But I also had to make sure that I was giving myself time, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, to get myself ready to, to pitch and to play and to not dwell on those, you know, negative thoughts too much, which obviously they, they occur. Um, and so it, it's, it, it's a kind of a, a battle and a little bit of a, you know, balance you got to find out there. And, uh, you know, fortunately at some point or another, I think in probably 2007, before I got to feel, fortunately, before I got to Philly, I started feeling really good about just, you know, my, my approach and everything out there and kind of my mindset and everything else. But um, yeah, there were some tough moments, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, it, it is uh, ultimately kind of interesting too. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I've, I've seen this before where, you know, your career kind of gets, you know, morphed down into, into two moments, you know, where you give up the big home for me, you know, giving up the big home run to pools and then winning the world series. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because obviously there's, there's so many more moments, so many other, you know, postseason saves that there were great moments in the, in the playoffs or whatever else, but uh, sometimes it all just gets melted down into that, into those two things. And I'm just thinking, you know, for myself, I'm just fortunate if they were going to be those two things that are happened in that order and not the other way around. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I, I was thinking, you know, in Albert's farewell tour about how, like, we never let guys like you get past those moments <laughs> as long as Albert is still playing. We never, we couldn't let you forget that home run. <laughs> hey, so at least Albert finally got out of your way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I mean, it's, it is kind of funny, but like, I honestly found myself this year uh, really uh, genuinely kind of happy watching him play and like, you know, with, with a genuine smile, watching him go on a great run uh, these last couple of months and uh, thinking, man, some of these younger pitchers had no idea what it was like to face <laughs> Albert in his prime. And now they're finally <laughs> tasted a little bit. <laughs> right. 
fastball, get me over fastball to him. You can't do that to Albert Pujols. So, uh, you know, I started uh, being able to kind of in, in enjoy his career and uh, everything he's done. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a little while, right? But, um, but I'm really uh, genuinely, uh, you know, grateful again for the moments that, that happened for me. If I wouldn't have given up that home run, I never would have been in Philly. Um, so that's the way I look at it. But I'm also genuinely uh, uh, happy that he got to end on such an incredible note, such an incredible run uh, for such an incredible career. Well, Brad, I'm, I'm curious, uh, just thinking back the whole career through minor league baseball and all that, uh, what, what are some of those moments that maybe nobody knows about? You know, I like I had a walk off Grand Slam once and I know Jason's never heard this story uh, in never. a ball in the Carolina League. You know, and that's that's actually the only professional Grand Slam I ever had. And it was opposite field. So it was like nothing was right about that. So I'm curious, do you have any like circle moments in the minor leagues or that, that maybe didn't certainly didn't get the world series attention of those two moments we, you mentioned. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, the minor leagues were, they were a circus. I mean, I was chronically injured chron at one point after I got, so I got drafted in the first round by the Astros and, you know, the expectations are high, but I was hurt so often at one point I had more surgeries in the, in the, when I was like my third year with the Astros, I had four surgeries and three wins. Uh, <laughs> so, it was not good. I mean, it was a, uh, getting out on the field was like the hardest thing for me. Every time I got to like 20 innings, it's funny. My Jersey number was 20, but every time I got to 20 innings, I got hurt. Um, and so I tried to change it to the highest number I could, which ultimately when I got to like house 54, I was like, that's better than 20. So I'll take that. Um, and, but, but I do remember kind of the mental grind of thinking how oh, man, you know, the, after another injury, how many credits do I need to go back and, you know, get my degree and, and uh, you know, start a different, a different walk of life because my arm, for whatever reason, is just not meant to pitch. I mean, I had all kinds of, uh, you know, bad luck things, too. I took a line drive comebacker in, uh, in a ball that broke my right arm, my, my ulna bone, right in half. I still have a plate in there from that. And so, you know, there's just a lot of moments for me when I think back about the minor leagues that, that are really hard. Like, it was just hard to get it. But, but I think for me, the biggest – the most joyful moment I should say was in triple a actually being able to pitch as a starting pitcher and go six, seven innings. It was like the first time I could really do it. And ironically, when I started feeling like, okay, I can be a starting pitcher and throw for a while. I had one start, my first start, my only start in the major leagues in 2002 against the Milwaukee Brewers. And I go out there and I'm in uh finish up the third inning. I go two for two with two hits, <laughs> It was like the greatest game I felt ever, you know, as a starting pitcher. Um, but my second at bat, I kind of pulled my uh, oblique muscle. Uh, on, oh, on no. So, but, you know, after the game, I was, so I got taken out of innings. But after the game, I was like, man, I'm just, I'm penciling myself into the rotation next year, maybe the number five guy, whatever. And I remember after the game, Brad Ausmus came up to me and he's like, hey, uh, you know, great job. He's like, I don't want you to get upset, but uh, I, you know, I had some, some talks with uh, some of the brass. I, I, I'm recommending that you kind of go to the bullpen. And I was like, what? I mean, I felt <laughs> nice, you know, in the back right there. What are you talking about? And he's like, he's basically saying, listen, you're, you're slider. He's like, you're, you're going to be a closer someday, but your changeup is awful. Like there's no <laughs> way you're going to be able to throw three pitches in the major leagues and have success because you really have <laughs> Fighter, and they can work but your changeup is terrible and so anyway we got a kick out of that but uh um yeah that start in milwaukee was uh was kind of a double-edged sword for me but uh as i said before you know i can't complain about the uh trajectory of my career and brad auspice obviously knew what he was talking about <laughs> so did you so you get to sit on that 1000 batting average for a while huh Where, where'd you finish uh, Higher than Louisville? sure well let's <laughs> Next five at bats I had, you know, as a closer, as a reliever, a setup guy or a closer, uh, I was told to not swing the bat when I got up there. So um, I think I was able to, however, put one ball in play, but I was, I, I finished my career two for seven. And I think the next five at bats were four punch outs and maybe one ball that I hit like literally four feet forward. Uh, <laughs> that was what I put in play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to say that wasn't your fault. They told you not to swing. What were you supposed to do? Um, <laughs> Hey, before we let you go, man, we have to play America's favorite game, which is, of course, know your Astros, Phillies, Brad Lidge trivia. Are you ready to play the game, Brad? I'll give it my best. <laughs> All right. I think you can do this. Besides you, there are four other pitchers who have saved at least 10 games for both the Phillies and the Astros. Mm. Can you name them? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, 
Billy Wagner is going to be my easy go-to. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Uh, you get that uh, one. <laughs> boy, this is <laughs> tough. Um, you know, I feel like Mitch Williams was pitched for the Astros too, but maybe he doesn't get saves. Yeah. Okay. Mitch, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a hint. Mitch only got six for the Astros. So <laughs> Man, you, you, you still have three to go. You, all right. You played with one of these guys. Who am I missing? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now I'm feeling uh, <laughs> not so great. Oh, boy. Man, you, you, you caught me on a bat. Uh, 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 all right. Well, I'm, I'll give you a hint on that guy. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you obviously saved the game that's that sent the Phillies to the playoffs in 2008. This guy saved the game that sent the Phillies to the playoffs the year before that. Oh, Brett Myers. Brett Myers is correct. Uh, 19 for the Astros, 21 for the Phillies. So then the other two, one guy was before you. The other guy was after your time. One's, one's really recent. Um, Ken he, Giles. Ken Giles is right. <laughs> so you only got one more. Um, give, me a, give me a decade. Is, is it? <laughs> it's before me or... It, this was kind of Glanville's era. This was a <laughs> 90s kind of guy. Oh, so I try to guess here. Saved mm. a ton of games for the Astros, but I believe made the all-star team for the Phillies. <laughs> I oh, wow. I looked into all this stuff. Mm. Man, that is going to be... Did I play with him? Uh, you missed him, actually. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you faced him now. We're going to have to team up on this one, but I feel like we're not going to do very well either. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, so neither of you have any clue? Oh, I'm trying to, is he a lefty or righty? He was righty. Mm. And he was their closer. Very well-known guy. Oh, like Doug Jones or something like that? Doug Jones is right. <laughs> are, we, are, we giving, are we giving credit for this? Uh, what, you, what are we doing here? If, if Tim, if this had, Mayor Tim, if this had been me and Glanville trying to get this question, would you have awarded us <laughs> yeah, probably, a right answer? We, we did pretty well. You you guys know, but we'll give it to Brad. He's a guest in the <laughs> See what we deal with every week, Brad. <laughs> That's tough. That's real tough. You know, that was a that was a good, fair question, and I'm not about how poorly I did answering it. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> it worked out. We, you got it right, according to the mayor. Yeah, yeah, we you know, there right. was some fun. There was some fun guesses. Mitch, uh, Larry Anderson, but he didn't have enough saves yeah. in Philly. Flash Gordon pitched for both. Chad Qualls pitched for both. Oh, Hector is obviously doing it now, but yeah. Anyway, this is why it's America's favorite game exactly <laughs> or not thank you <laughs> hey, brad we could talk to you for hours man but uh, we've all got a lot on our plate these days um <laughs> so thank you so much for carving out time to explore uh the archaeology of starkville <laughs> <laughs> right awesome yeah we swept out all the corners on this one guys it was, uh... <laughs> yeah we liked having you man thank you so much see you at the ballpark <laughs> 